waiting for my slides and then yes. wonderful, here we are. Good. I'm yeah, I'm Felix. I'm part of a research group um, that really looks in all kinds of different areas as neural space. And what I speak today about is a project that we have, an ongoing project in collaboration with a hospital that we call MedSpace. So we analyze all kinds of medical images from them. It goes from CT to MRI to X-ray, and we apply Bayesian deep learning. So a little agenda. We first have to get all of you on the same level. I will recap a little bit what probability theory is. Then afterwards, it's a very short recap of deep learning, how it's different from deep learning, uh, how it's different from Bayesian deep learning. And then we go specifically into a method that was uh, developed by DeepMind about three or four years ago that's called Bayes by Backdrop. Um, later on we will look a little bit into uncertainty because all that Bayesian deep learning gives us some kind of uncertainty measurement, so how sure our output is of the network, and then we apply it to medical image analysis. Yeah, it's mathematically quite of heavy, I would say. But uh, please, yeah, please bear with me. <laughs> and I will go, like, just raise your hand, right, if you don't understand something. And um, yeah, we just recap that. OK, what are probabilities? A probability is something uh, what is uncertain, basically. So we have an event x, and then that event can either be totally impossible, or it can be totally certain. So the probability of that event x is always between 0 and 1. Makes it easy. We only have numbers between 0 and 1. OK, another fundamental aspect of that entire understanding is a random variable. So that's the quantity x. We usually say a capital X, and whose value is uncertain. So that means automatically that x has a probability theory. And the capital X can then be all kinds of different events, what we usually say, they say are lowercase x's. OK, so you might ask, like, why do we need that? Doesn't make sense to have that and all that. But what we do in machine learning, right, is we do predictions, we do forecasts all the time. So even when you uh, take the weather forecast for the, for the upcoming day, we usually get 15 degrees, we get sunny. OK, but can it actually be sure? Can we be totally sure that it is going to be tomorrow 15 degrees and sunny? I doubt it. We can't be. What happens very often, we have rain and probably not 15 degrees. So would it not make more sense that we actually have a probability that we say it's kind of likely that we have sun and that we have 15 degrees? with probability of 0 0.7, what means 70%. But wouldn't it also make sense to give us some probability of 13 degrees, of 14 degrees, of 16 degrees, of 17 degrees? And couldn't it be also that we have some probability that it's actually raining? We don't know, right? So another example, what we, what we worked on in that project is a medical image analysis. So we have an x-ray of our chest. And then a doctor is saying, OK, here we have lung cancer. But can the doctor be actually be totally certain? There are tons of examples out where the doctor was wrong, ruined basically a human's life, uh, gave him me heavy medicine, and in the end he was really healthy, what happened quite a lot. So wouldn't it be actually kind of a good insight if we have some kind of uncertainty measurement, if we just know how certain actually the prediction is? And that is what Bayesian deep learning does. So just to yeah, recap deep learning, um, you've probably seen something like that before. A deep neural network is simply some input x, what I have a pointer, yeah, what we have here. Then we have some weights, what is kind of making the decision, but it's a very influential in the decision. Then we have some nonlinear transformation that is called g, and we have here something, or just like I displayed here something, what is called a sigmoid, fun sigmoid function, uh, what is just a nonlinear transformation. And then in the end, we have a prediction that's at y hat what is nothing else than the g of w multiplied by x. And then we have our output, right? OK, so the w's are the um, kind of most influential factors in that entire learning, because they are actually um, saying what kind of output we will get in the end. And how, how actually a deep neural network is learning is by backpropagation. That's an algorithm that was developed 20, well, probably more than 20 years ago. By a, call, by a guy called Jan LeCun and some other guys. He's now at Facebook. Uh, and what it basically does is two, two steps. Uh, first, we measure the error. So we have some kind of cost function, what is also called error function, loss function. You've probably seen that. It's basically we take the prediction of the network, what is it y hat, and then we compare it to a label. So when we give an image of a house, we tell the network that's a house, and then we compare 
um, what the network actually gave out. So the network might have given out that this picture of a house is a dog, but it's wrong. So we compare it so it gets some kind of higher error function, some higher cost. Um, in the next step, we measure how responsible these weights are for the, for the error. And that is done by something, what is the partial derivative. So we take, uh, we take the total cost, what is kind of a number, and then we look how responsible each of the weights, right? Like there's never only one weight in the, in the deep neural network. There are always, whatever, millions of different weights. And then we look how responsible each of the weights is for the given error in total. And then we update them. So we uh, take some kind of learning weight alpha, take the weight of the previous step, of the previous iteration, we call it, and then calculate the new weight. And then we do that just t thousands of time again. We kind of get the weights that, um, that minimize that error here, and then we have more correct predictions. That's all what it's about. Okay, that was all deep learning. But, yeah, what is now Bayesian deep learning? First of all, like the really distinguishing feature is that we have in a normal neural network here on the right side, we have these numbers as weights, right? So just from the previous slide, from the back propagation, we learn these numbers as weights, and these numbers should be then somehow um, giving, us, giving us many right predictions. In Bayesian deep learning, we don't take a number, we take a probability distribution. So you've probably seen a normal distribution, what is like that bell-shaped distribution, and what that distribution has, you need two values to learn the distribution. We just take, um, take the mean, what is the most likely value, what is the, like the middle of that entire bell, and then we also take a variance, what is saying how wide is our distribution. So that's like a really um, yeah, kind of interesting and difficult problem because we have now these two values that we want to know and before we had only one value. That makes it, <coughs> makes it all a bit, a bit difficult. But how do we actually learn these distributions? There is something, what well, is a very special trick, what was developed like just two years ago but makes it all kind of simple. So we have that distribution, what you see here on the right side. And instead of one value, we have two values. What is mean, what we, um, yeah, so we, said, uh, we said mu, we said Greek letter, and then we have a variance or a standard deviation, what we call a sigma. And then the weights, what we had before, are basically these parameters, zeta. And yeah, the zeta is a collection of that mean and the variance. And then we have that weight here again, what is now only one value, because we have, uh, we have that function of epsilon, and epsilon is a normal distribution. So we kind of hide our distribution inside of these weight values, but when we later on we recover that, we still have these two values, what, what give us a distribution, right? But we can do the back propagation because we only have one value, because um, these partial derivatives that I spoke about uh, yeah, you can only compute them when you have one given value, and that is that, that weight. But so we're actually kind of good with that, with that special trick here. Okay, so um, all that Bayesian, like it's called Bayesian deep learning, right? So we have something what is called Bayes rule. What is, uh, what is basically said? So we have here on the left side, it's a probability distribution of the weights given the data. So that's what we are interested in, right? The weights are the decision makers of the network, and then we have the data. So we want to have the weights after we have seen all the data. And that is the uh, posterior, we call it posterior distribution. That is the one um, yeah, distribution we want to know. And that is computed by a prior, so that means some kind of belief or domain knowledge. It is something like when we, when we have seen some similar data before, we kind of can give the network already a guess how, how these distributions might look like. We multiply that by a likelihood, what is the probability of the data given, uh, given the weight, so how well our, um, our data that is currently represented by, by the weights. And then we just normalize it by a data distribution. What um, is a bit unfortunate in that entire setting is that this data distribution is intractable, and I will explain in a minute what intractable means. Such a, it simply means uh, that you cannot compute it in any, in any foreseeable time. And when we have on the right-hand side of the equal sign an intractable like, entity or term, we also have that on the left-hand side, right? So 
as I said before, that posterior is actually the one probability distribution we want to know, but given it's intractable, it makes things very difficult. So, um, yeah, what does intractable actually mean? Uh, we have a training that you can imagine, you, we can talk about ImageNet, we can talk about CIFAR 100. Uh, so in CIFAR 100, we have, we have 100 different classes. Each class has, whatever, 600 images or so. And these could be images of houses. So um, you train the network with 600 images of houses, but what, what do you want in the end? You want to go around London, take a picture of a house, and you want that the, um, that the network is able to give you an output that's a house. Right? And that, that image of the house in London is probably not part of, that, of the data that what you train on. So you want to, want to have some kind, of higher, uh, some kind of higher pattern of a house and that each house in the world can be actually recognized by, by the network. So our training that is only a small part of the entire data distribution. The PFD would mean we have uh, data or we have the data that from all houses in the world and then can have a precise precise knowledge of the data distribution, but we don't have that. So we, we only have a little sample, like a, some kind of examples of the entire distribution. That, that is what it means when it's intractable. We do, don't know it exactly. And that will also be never possible because it's just totally infeasible to take pictures of all houses in the entire world. Okay, let's go back to that. We have here, we have the intractability here, all the intractable of the le left-hand side, but what we want to focus on is now the posterior because that's exactly what we want to know. So when we don't know how something um, can be computed exactly, we have in statistics million of approximation methods. So we do approximations here. You can understand that the true distribution, what is that P of the posterior, P of W given D, looks maybe something like that. And then we have basically two big families of different methods. And there's one method called variational distribution or variational inference. What means we place a second distribution on top of the true distribution and then kind of make these two somehow looking similar. Or we have Monte Carlo methods, what means we take random samples from the true distribution and then when we have taken millions of samples, we might have some guess how the true distribution actually looks like. Um, since the Monte Carlo methods are really difficult for complicated distributions because like in a deep neural network, these distributions are usually very, very complex and multidimensional and so on. B takes a variation distribution because it's much faster. And that's actually what we, what we speak today about, about the entire, entire variation inference. So yeah, just to get us on the same level, we have the true distribution, the blue one, what we usually call P, and then we have a variational distribution, what we can learn, what is that, that red one, the Q. And the, we use here the parameter theta again, what is nothing else than the mean and the variance of the distribution. So what we do is simply we learn mean of the variance of every weight, and we then have, well, yeah, aim in the end that we have it somehow similar. So we find these parameter theta that define this distribution Q, what makes Q somehow similar to P. I'm also giving you some graphical intuition because I know, I know it's, fairly, it's fairly complex. So you can understand there's Q, um, all the possible values that uh, theta can take in, which define the Q, are given by some space. And so the true distribution P is very unfortunately out of that space, what means we can approximate it, but we can never be exactly how the true distribution. And then we start. We take some initial values for theta. Very often we just take mean zero, variance one, because that's called standard normal distribution and somehow works kind of, kind of well. But we want to like, learn over time, right? We train the network for millions of, of iterations and thousands of epochs until it gets, gets somewhere very close to the P. And we do that by, so we, we then kind of want to make P, P similar to Q, and there's something what is called the KL divergence, what is called kullback leibler divergence, which is um, kind of measuring how similar these two distributions are. We call it divergence, you can see it as a distance, or you can just see it as a difference of these two distributions. So we have that KL divergence, 
and then we actually want to minimize that KL divergence that we arrive finally at some optimal, val optimal values for theta, which make um, Q very similar to P. But there's still, some there's still some difference between those, so we can never be exactly the same. Okay, let's go into ZKL divergence. Just explaining it a bit, how, how it's calculated. It looks, it looks all complex, but you don't need to understand it, um, understand it in detail. What is as a one very interesting aspect is that we have an integral here. So an integral you can see as an infinite, infinite long sum, right? And then when we actually come to compute that infinite long sum, we can't, again, we can't uh, determine it, we can't calculate it exactly. So because it's infinite and you, we never know an answer for that. So we have here some intractability again. What, um, yeah, what we do very similar stuff than before, we need to approximate it again. So some more mathematics, you can see that as a E, what means expected value of that entire log thing here in the brackets, but that's not too important. Um, so we find these optimal values. We have <coughs> then an optimization problem because we have that arc min, what means we want to find some minimum, um, some minimum values for theta, which, uh, which, makes, that, which makes that E as, as small as possible. And these are optimal values because when these, um, when, when we have C theta, Q is very similar to P. Okay, we can rephrase it, no need to worry about that. We have some constants that we can kick out and all. But all that rephrasing doesn't make, a, doesn't make too much sense because we still have interactability. <coughs> so um, there is what base by backdrop comes in. Like there, the, the problem has been there for, I don't know, for 20 years probably and people just didn't know how to handle that interactability and was statistically a very hard problem. But then uh, some really bright minds, um, a deep mind developed something what is called base by backdrop. And what they do here is actually combining these two big families, what I, what I spoke about earlier. So we have that variational distribution, right? What is that, that bell shape here on top of the true distribution, the blue one. Um, but since the KL divergence is intractable, we can take or we actually go around that by taking some samples from that, uh, from that red distribution. So we combine variation inference with Monte Carlo, and then people call it Monte Carlo variation inference, or they just call it base by backdrop. What all that thing is doing is having um, here a sum sign instead of an integral. So be because we take these samples, we have actually a, f yeah, a finite number of samples that we take and not that integral, what is basically infinite number. So we take now these samples and we can actually just hard code in our algorithm how many samples we want to take and then we can actually get to some kind of good approximation. So um, yeah, all that intractable what we, what we have seen before is all basically redeemed by, by that sum sign, uh, what makes it all yeah, feasible. Okay, but we still speak of probability distributions and as like the very first slide when I uh, define probability, it's something what is uncertain, an event X that has some kind of uncertainty. But what does that uncertainty actually tell us? There are two kind of different, different uncertainties. What is epistemic and aleatoric? You don't need to focus too much on the, on the terms, but it simply gives us some insights what actually these uncertainties can, can do. So when it comes to predicting, we have um, set variance that we spoke before, right? And what we have here is that P of uh, Y star gap an X star is just the distribution of a new input, so a house, what we haven't seen before, and then we, give, we have a Y star, what is a prediction of that, that input. And we don't have a label to that because it's now a predictive distribution. So, we have that variance, and that variance is simply the sum of that aleatoric and the epistemic uncertainty. And what you can understand these different uncertainties is basically that aleatoric is da data that caused. So you have, you can see it as some noisy data set, right? So you have, um, whatever, let's say 600 pictures of houses. And these houses look all very different. It's very hard to, for an algorithm, for a deep neural network, to find actually some high-level pattern, what a house looks like. So that is, that is all called aleatoric uncertainty. And then we have a second one that's 
epistemic and that is it's a model based or model cause uncertainty. So when you have, let's look at, again at ImageNet. ImageNet is something like 40 gigabytes, so it's a huge data set. And then we take, a, we take a, a CNN, a deep neural network that has maybe two hidden layers. Each layer has 400 units or so. So naturally, like when you have some kind of experience with deep neural networks, we know that it's probably predicting horribly. We maybe get a, get a, an, yeah, a accuracy, a validation accuracy, that means the right predictions of maybe 30, 40 percent, but it's extremely low. Um, but then we have, when we do that patient deep learning, we have an epistemic uncertainty, but will be extremely high, and that gives us at the same time then some kind of knowledge that we need to need to make a more sophisticated model, and probably increase the number of layers, increase the number of units, and add at whatever. Sure. Okay, so we applied all that to medical image analysis. What we did was we took some MRIs, we took some CT recordings, uh, some ultrasound, and some just like simple X-ray. So um, there was all in collaboration with a with a hospital, and they gave us, for example, some some images from Alzheimer. And like the people who uh, are from our group from Neural Space, like did not really have an idea of of Alzheimer or any kind of medical images. But then we worked with the doctors together, and they had like these kind of areas are kind of um, distinguishing if a patient has Alzheimer or not. It's usually a bit smaller when the patient has, has Alzheimer. And then in an um, the image where, there are, where the patient has no Alzheimer, these areas are usually a bit bigger. So we simply detect, right? We have an input A, we have an input B, and our network should simply detect if there's Alzheimer in that image or if there's no Alzheimer. And so Given that entire, uh, entire, entire Bayesian deep learning, we have a uh, probability of Alzheimer. So if the image S has actually Alzheimer, we talk now about the image A here. And then we also have some, some uncertainty measurements. So what, what, is, what was, like for that example, just really good. We have a really high um, certainty that the image actually contains Alzheimer. But it would be just phenomenal, right? If um, or it is phenomenal that we have that we have a probability distribution here because if that is fairly low, we we know actually that we maybe need a different model to uh, to have an output, or we maybe need a second opinion from a doctor and so on. So we don't have that um, totally deterministic output of a neural network anymore. We have a probability distribution, what makes it uh, what makes it somehow more more insightful. So we worked then on Alzheimer detection. We also worked on localization, what means we have these bounding boxes. We just gave the network the task to actually find the distinguishing features of the brain that is saying if there's Alzheimer, yes or no. And then it actually found by itself that there are these exact areas what the doctors anyway told us, what was just a really good confirmation that the network is looking at the right places, right? And then we have again a probability of the box. And yeah, automatically sees uncertainty estimations. Okay, so we worked with brain MRI then uh, just in the beginning to like kind of get a feeling how medical images work. We worked on a data that that's actually on Kaggle, so you can just play around with it. What is it? Malaria detection, so there are some human cells that have some parasites, which means malaria, malaria yes. And we have some uninfected, which means malaria no. And then we played a little bit around with different data sets. So we took all the data, we only took half, only a quarter, and basically looked at these uncertainty estimations. Because you, you can already guess when we only have 25% of the data, the data that is kind of noisy because it's difficult to see some high, high level patterns. What means that the aleatoric uncertainty is automatically high compared to the one that is 100%, it's, it's much lower. Just to get some, yeah, it was basically for us to play around a bit and get some feeling of in which range we can expect values. Then we also um, looked in the chest, uh, chest x-ray with lung diseases. I think specifically it was lung cancer what we looked here. And then we actually applied both. We said, uh, please give us a box and please give us um, a, de a detection, yes or no. So we found that area, have again a probability of the box and these uncertainty estimates. That was all. I hope it was not too heavy. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. I will, I will take questions, of course, 
uh, short to neural space VR, the combination of different kind of research institutions as Element AI people, the German Research Art uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence, Imperial College, ETH, and we kind of look at all kind of different uh, projects and people who want to join. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Felix, for that. Uh, and we've got uh, time for a couple of questions. And I see a couple of hands shooting up already. Uh, Felix, uh, yeah, choose please, away. Please sit on the front, yeah. <coughs> and you've got mics in front of you, and there's a button on the mic. Push the talk. And then, or oh, maybe we have to wave at Dan. Dan, can you make the mics work, please? No. Shout loudly. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, so, so, well, psychology research, so okay. in, like the space race and so on. Um, have you did, have you tested that with actual doctors in sort of clinical settings? Yeah. yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Can you he, he asked. Repeat the question. Um, the said doctors are in general very bad in interpreting probabilities. Uh, what is not my experience, but it might be. Um, and then he asked if he have any experience with that. Right. That was a question. Okay, um, so we worked on that project with a with kind of a large Indian hospital. It was in India. Um, doctors were not that bad in interpreting probability. We see our output just as a second opinion, right? We don't want to replace a human, the human in the decision making, but uh, just to give him because it's yeah, like there are always not enough resources to look properly at an image, uh, even though you have like a massive, massive decision in your hands as a doctor, right? Um, so we see that as just a second opinion for the doctor. And like after whatever, one, two hours of bit explaining about probability, they were actually quite fine. <laughs> There's a lady with a head here. Um, We Could you repeat the question? Yep. Uh, the question was what kind of data that we used, how, where we got the data from, uh, yeah, and just in general the data. That, so we started with that data that on Kaggle, what everyone can download, what is, I think, not too big, maybe half a gigabyte or so, 500 megabytes. I don't know how many images there are, but we just wanted to uh, explore the possibilities of, like, we can take any data that, right, because it's the algorithm behind, doesn't matter, or it doesn't care. If we have medical images or if we have uh, if we have houses, but we just took that medical image analysis, uh, that medical image data that for what was on Kaggle just freely, openly for download, and but then we uh, used the data or the images we got from that hospital, what were then MRI images, CT, we got some uh, maybe some ultrasound images and what was any X-ray, normal X-rays. Yeah, we, um, we, we gave in the beginning, we had, um, we, we had doctors saying that on, on that image is, on that image is cancer, there's no cancer. So we gave some kind of training that, and then, but that was only for, for a given amount, and then everything else was then just, um, yeah, was done by, the, was done by uh, the algorithm who then gives these classifications or predictions. Sorry? <laughs> Might be worth carrying on that conversation uh, in the break. Let's take yeah. one more question. Okay. Down the front. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, very roughly, can you talk a little bit about uh, what pre processing technique you use before feeding the neural net with the images? Yeah. Um, we do something like we, we had the images as JPEG or PNG, I can't remember. Um, but then we had some data augmentation. So we flipped the image a little bit, we rotated it for 180. Uh, yeah, just flipped it over, uh, what else did we use? I think we cropped it randomly. So we artificially made our data that bigger, right? So then like you first take a part from the left top of the image, what might be some cancer, but then you take a, as the second one, it's still the same image, but then you take the bottom right part of the image, and then you have actually already two data examples out of one, out of one image. XY. Sorry? You mean x, y, the coordinates. Yeah, so we, we take, yeah? But, I mean, Medical images are very like, um, 
in general? Yeah, I mean, look, you, you have three components, the RGB, right? So mm -hmm. if you normally do a transformation, you transform the image in two dimensions in order to process it like one or two things. Okay. Um, as I remember, we, we got the images as 2D already. Oh, okay. And then, then we just do it so that I, yeah. I might have done some pre-processing, I'm not sure. Yeah. It could be, yeah. So I can imagine there could be lots, well, I know there are lots more questions. There are many hands up. We haven't got time for those right now. Uh, Felix, uh, will you be around at the pub afterwards yes, at yes. the end of the evening? So Felix will be here all evening, all evening, folks. Um, just keep piling questions over and buying beer and saying thanks uh, or Cokes or whatever it might be. Um, but say thanks uh, to our speaker. Uh, we'll take a break shortly. There'll be an announcement from AHHead in a minute. But first of all, let's just uh, thank uh, Thank Felix. you.